Thanks, Charlie. Thanks very much for coming, everybody. I really appreciate your time and effort to get here. Uh, my name's Joe Hill. I'm the GCRF Program Manager at Innovate UK, um, and I manage the Demonstrate Impact competition. So today, I'm going to tell you about the competition, the structure, the scope, the eligibility, and so on, and there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. So Demonstrate Impact is funded by the Grand Challenges Research Fund, uh, which is official development assistance money from the government, um, specifically to tackle, uh, address global challenges um, in developing countries. And it's designed to support pioneering research and innovation. Um, we came on board last year in 2019 at Innovate UK as a delivery partner, it's particularly to support the commercialization of innovation as part of this fund. We have six programs in our GCR GCRF portfolio and Demonstrate Impact is one of those. So why did we launch Demonstrate Impact? Well, we believe that there are um, affordable, innovative, appropriate solutions out there to global challenges in developing countries, but they're not always being applied. And why is this? Well, one of the biggest factors is risk. Uh, businesses may feel that it's too risky to launch a new product or service in a developing country. Investors, oh, that sounds better. <laughs> Found my voice. <laughs> um, investors may think it's too risky to back a new innovation or a new product or service in a developing country. And customers and users may be reluctant to adopt unproven or untested um, products or services. So essentially, De Demonstrate Impact is a de-risking mechanism. We are enabling businesses to take the time to go out to a developing country and do a feasibility study and, and start prototyping their innovation. Um, and and really, it's uh, enabling businesses to get their innovations to market quicker. So we're looking to support innovations that have the potential for transformative change. And what we mean by that is innovations that could potentially create new markets, boost infrastructure, improve value chains, create jobs, etc. And we're looking for innovations that are demonstration ready. That means that they are almost ready for market. There's not a huge amount of technical development that still needs to be done, but they're not yet in market, or at least they're not in the developing country market that you want to focus on. They may be being sold in other markets, um, but not in this focus market. We're looking for solutions that meet a real gap in the market, a real demand. We're looking for solutions that are potentially commercial and have high potential for social and economic impact. And we're also looking for project teams that have a genuine desire to really engage with end users, customers, stakeholders, partners in the local context. What we're not looking for is a tech push from the UK or parachuting in ideas that um, don't take into account the local context. As I said, this is um, official development assistance money, and that means that the primary beneficiaries must be the poor and disadvantaged communities in developing countries. And that can be directly through um, access to new products and services to solve their challenges, or indirectly through greater access to jobs, better infrastructure, improved value chains, and so on. As a secondary outcome, obviously we want to support UK businesses to have that chance to go and test the viability of their innovations and to um, find new partners. So the competition structure, um, we have two phases. We're calling phase one discovery and we're calling phase two prototype. In phase one, we're offering up to £60,000 grant over six months to do this market feasibility study. And in phase two, we're offering up to half a million pounds in grant over one to three years to do prototyping work. Uh, this is the second round of the competition. We've already won, run one round. Um, and just to give you a few statistics, in the last round, we had 155 applications and we were able to fund 31 businesses at phase one. In this round, we have enough funds to support 30 businesses 
um, at phase one. The reason we could fund an extra one last time was because some people didn't apply for the maximum of £60,000. And so that gave us a bit of leeway and we were able to fund an additional business. So I would say, in terms of collective benefit, if you don't need the maximum of 60000 just apply for what you need. And that actually might allow us to fund another one or two businesses. <clears throat> um, it's also worth saying, oh, in our cohort that we've selected for phase one, they are working across 23 different countries um, and across uh, tackling eight different um, sustainable development goals, <coughs> with health and water happen to be um, the most popular in that round. Phase two is a closed competition. So only those who are successful at phase one can apply for phase two. Phase one is an open competition. Um, so like I say, at phase one, what we're, trying to encourage, what we're trying to enable people to do is to go out and really gain those um, uh, real world insights from the ground in the market that they want to work in. And we're making it mandatory in this round for people to use human-centered design methodology to do that. Um, and I can answer questions on that and go into that in a bit more detail. The reason that we're doing that is that largely this competition is based on um, other programs that Innovate UK have run with the Design Foundation, whereby small businesses went through a human-centred design process. And the res response of businesses was really excellent. <clears throat> they said it helped them gain insight into how users behave and what users really want. Um, it enabled them to not rush in and launch something that wouldn't work. So it saved them time and it saved them money. And it helped them avoid getting tunnel visioned on the technology, which is so easy to do. It really helped them step back and think about what problem are we actually trying to solve? How are we actually trying to help people? And what do people want? And I think in the context of the developing world, this is extremely important because you'll be operating in, in a very different context. Um, and human-centered design really helps distinguish between need and demand. Um, so for example, it's there's a it's very easy to identify need in, the, in, the, in developing countries. You might say, in many countries, there's a huge need for clean water. There's plenty of evidence to back that up. It's undeniable, um, no doubt about that. However, that doesn't mean that people are going to want to buy your water filter. That's a whole different question. And it's that question that we're um, going to support you to answer during the feasibility study in phase one. And there's countless examples across developing countries where water filters, water pumps, all sorts of other technology is lying in disrepair and disuse um, because innovators didn't take into account local users, local user behavior or, or the context that they, that they were working in. So that's what we want to avoid. Um, and that's really the sort of foundation as to why we've built it in to demonstrate impact. We could easily say that most of us in this room or around the world need more exercise. We need to go to the gym. It doesn't mean we want to buy a gym membership. So it's really worth you know, checking your own assumptions um, and that's what we want to help you do. So I think I've covered most of um, the rationale behind phase one. Obviously, it, we want to help you gain the confidence in the market. It, it's a, it's a, a risk and an endeavor for yourselves. We want you to feel like this is the right thing to do um, by testing the water in phase one. The structure, oh, actually, I'll just say a few more words about that. Um, we do appreciate that backing very pioneering innovations is high risk. Um, and so we accept that some of these phase one projects may, may fail. Um, and that's the point, really, if, for you to discover that and decide whether you want to iterate or pivot or stop altogether. Um, and not uh, spend further time. So that we, we accept that as part of phase one. We also accept a degree of ambiguity and uncertainty. So for example, we're not expecting you to have a local partner on board at phase one. You, you can, and many of those who applied already did, um, but it's not mandatory. And part of phase one is about finding those local partners. You must have a local partner uh, at phase two. Um, what we will be looking for in your application forms, though, is the quality of activities at phase one. And so what we mean by this is 
what methods, what activities are you planning to enable you to really understand user behavior? Um, how are you going to observe your customers or your users? What activities are you going to do to, uh, around that? How are you going to uh, use stimulus, perhaps, to get a reaction from people? Um, how are you going to engage stakeholders and partners and really understand the local context? So it's the quality of activities in phase one that you're um, planning. And that's where a human-centered design professional may be able to help guide you as to what sort of activities you um, should be undertaking um, and what sort of tools you can use. Um, early stage design is a de-risking mechanism. Like I say, you're, if you do the right activities in phase one, you're more likely to gain traction, you're more likely to gain economic value, and you're probably more likely to attract further investment um, if you do the right activities, um, and that's why we've built it into the competition. <clears throat> so the structure, we're currently at phase one application stage. Um, the deadline is the 6th of May at 12 noon. You will then, your application will then be assessed by five different assessors to get a balanced perspective on it. You'll be notified of the decision on June the 19th. There's then a period of due diligence um, and project finance checking, which takes approximately three months. <clears throat> it can go slightly quicker, but we're allowing three months, so we're expecting projects to start mid-September, although this could all potentially change um, depending on the coronavirus situation, but that's our intention at the moment, that projects would start mid-September. That then lasts six months. Then you are eligible to apply for phase two. Um, now that process of applying, assessing and due diligence for phase two will take around <coughs> five to six months, we expect. Um, again, it, it may go quicker. Um, depending on a case-by-case -case basis. But we would also have to do due diligence on your overseas partner, so that can take time. Scope, let's talk about scope. There are five key factors. Um, I'll run th through an overview and then I'll go into a bit more detail about them. So, as I said before, we're looking for innovations that are demonstration ready, that address one of 10 SDGs that we've identified that are ODA eligible, it must operate in a DAC-listed country, um, and you must take into account gender equality and social inclusion. So these are the 10 SDGs that we've identified as part of this competition. Health, education, clean water and sanitation, decent work and economic growth, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, and so obviously that includes um, supply chains, waste, etc. Climate action, life below water, life on land, and peace, justice, and security. A strong institutions, rather. As you'll notice, we don't explicitly have energy and agriculture in this list, and that's because we have other funding for that. We have the Energy Catalyst and the Agritech Catalyst. And so if your project is very um, explicitly in those sectors, we encourage you to look at those other funds. Obviously, we have had uh, some applicants in those sectors who um, apply saying, well, actually, this is much more about, this project is much more about job creation or um, decent work, and so it may fit into one of these other um, categories or climate action. But have a look at those other funds to see if you'd be better suited. On your application form, we ask you to specify the sub-targets within the SDG. So each SDG has these sub-targets. So for example, if you're um, addressing SDG 6, we then ask you, well, within that, what are you really focusing on? Is it um, access to clean water for all, or is it access to sanitation for all? So we, um, it's very important that you specify the sub-target. Um, ODA eligibility, as I said, ODA, um, funding is aid provided by a donor government to developing countries um, to address economic develop development and welfare. Some money can be spent in the donor country, but not on capital infrastructure. It can pay for capital usage. To be eligible, you must investigate a specific problem or challenge in a developing country and identify why this is a problem and 
um, what pathway to impact you are planning to pursue. Um, and projects must work in the developing country as part of, of as part of phase one. So, um, for example, let's say you're working in an education uh, sector and your innovation is really only going to benefit those um, more wealthy private schools, for example. It's not going to be accessible for people outside the private school system. That would not be ODA eligible. Um, equally, if you have a, a water solution and it's really only going to be accessible for middle class or wealthy families, that would not be ODA eligible. So we really have to make sure that it's accessible um, to the more disadvantaged communities in that country. I mean, it may be um, a broader innovation that impacts all, but it must be accessible. So DAC listed countries, there are about 140 countries in scope. You can see the list, it's linked on the website. Um, it, essentially, this is all lower and middle income countries um, around the world. We have a few exceptions um, that are listed there that are not eligible for this competition. Um, on your application form, you must submit a gender equality and social inclusion statement. And this is part of the scope assessment. So if you don't um, submit this statement or you don't take it seriously, then you would be out of scope. Um, and what we want you to do is really consider how your, Im how your project is, again, going to be accessible um, in terms of gender equality and social inclusion and whether or not it might have unintended ne negative consequences. Um, so who's involved? Um, what impact is this going to have? Now, I guess I'll give you a few examples of ways to think about this. Um, for example, prior to this, I was working on an accelerator program where we helped businesses innovate to improve the lives of adolescent girls through products and services. And these businesses came from all sectors, financial services, agriculture, water, education, health, um, the building construction sector. And so it wasn't necessarily always obvious how their product or service um, met, uh, it would improve the lives of adolescent girls. But one thing we asked them to do was to consider in their sector how um, girls were disproportionately impacted by the status quo. So for example, with water, in clean water, in some countries, it's up to the girls to go and collect the water. And so that's going to take up a lot more of their time than boys. And if a member of the family gets sick, often it's the girls who have to stay home and look after the family member, so it means they can't go to school. So it's trying to think more broadly about how your sector or how the status quo is disproportionately impacting minorities um, or more disadvantaged members of the community. So that's one way of thinking about it. Um, we do feel like there's quite a correlation between the quality of the answers to this question um, on gender social um, and social inclusion and the quality of the application overall. That's what we found in phase one, is the people who really gave us a very thoughtful, carefully thought through answer to this question generally had a really carefully thought through application overall. Um, a few do's and don'ts. Um, it's not just about your organisation, you know, um, don't only focus on that. It's great if you have um, uh, a, a diverse team, obviously, and we'd like to know about that, but that's not the only thing that we're interested in, so don't only focus on that. Oops. Um, all right. So we want to know how you're going to take meaningful action towards um, engaging with this issue in your application form. Don't submit a kind of insufficient answer. We really want to know what you think about this. Um, but at the same time, if this, this is not your area of expertise, do reach out to us um, and ask for some support and help around this. My colleague Zoe, um, who works on this issue at Innovate UK, can't be here today, but she's happy for you to reach out to her. We'll, we'll circulate her email afterwards. You know, she can give you um, advice. What I would suggest is that you draft your answer and then you might want to send it in either to Zoe or to the KTN for a review and for feedback um, that if you're uncertain about how to go about that question. So that's to recap. Um, to be in scope, you need to address those five factors. Out of scope is fairly self-explanatory. It's not addressing those five factors in general, but there are a couple of um, points I really want to highlight here. Um, 
one in particular actually, it's the uh, uh, don't request more than £60,000 in grant. Um, now I know this sounds very obvious, but in the last round of this competition, 25% of applicants were ineligible because they asked for more than £60,000 in grant. And the reason is that on the, on the application form in the finance table, where you put in your project costs, I believe it automatically for SMEs calculates that 70% of those costs is the grant request. Now, if you're, we're saying that project costs can be between 85,000 and 120,000 pounds. So if your project costs are 85,000, then 70% of that is 60,000. But if your project costs are 120,000, you must manually adjust that percentage down to 50% in order for the table to show that you're only wanting £60,000. So it's really um, important that you double and triple check that finance table at the end before you submit, because your project partners might have added their project costs and it might have knocked it, knocked it over. And it's not enough to, th to say, well, I can put in whatever, they'll only give me 60. So, and that's what a lot of people thought. They thought, well, I know it shows more than 60, but they'll only give me 60. And that's not the case. If you're, if you're requesting more than 60, you'll be ineligible. And it's heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking for us to see so many great, good quality projects who'd taken the time to apply be suddenly becoming ineligible. And if you've got any questions about this or any um, technical difficulties when you're filling in the form, please get in touch um, directly with the KTN or with me and we can help make sure that you don't... Um, fall into that trap. Eligibility criteria. Um, so in order to apply, you must have a UK business as the admin lead. Um, and the technical lead can be a company from any country. The UK business lead can be a company of any size. Um, it will, uh, that admin lead will um, administer the funds. All the funds will go to that UK business and then they will disperse the funds to the project partners and they will be responsible for accounting for those funds. Um, the other partners can be businesses or universities or NGOs and like I said they can be from any country. Um, you can subcontract up to 50% of the costs and research organisations um, can claim up to 30% of the project costs. Um, you must do some work in the developing country. Like I said, project costs can be between 85 and, a, and 120, um, but with 60,000 as the maximum grant amount. I think this is what I've already covered. Um, the, the UK business can obviously also be the technical partner as well. Um, These are the percentages of grant finance that you can request, depending on what size your business, what size the UK business is, and this is all explained on on the website. But for small and uh, small businesses, you can claim seventy percent of the of the of your project costs as the grant. And international partners are um, funded on the same grant percentages as those. So if you're partnering with a small business in another country, they are also eligible for 70% of the costs. Key dates are 6th of May at 12 noon, that's when you have to submit your application. Please don't leave it to the last minute if you possibly can, although a lot of people do, but it's quite risky. Um, and you will be informed on the 19th of June. The KTN is a fantastic resource in terms of support. Um, so if you're wanting to find particularly human-centered design professionals um, to help you, KTN has a great network of those. So um, get in touch with them and they can help connect you. Um, the EEN can help you connect you to business partners um, in the UK and overseas. The KTN also offers a, an application review service um, and also, if you have got, got any questions or want some feedback on your concept, get in touch with them. Um, and if it's on a more technical issue around the application or the scope, um, do get in touch with our own customer services helpline at Innovate UK. Um, and you can also ask to be put through straight to me as well. Right, that's all for me. So do you have any questions? Relating to the 
into total project costs and grant. So I understand that total project costs are between 85k and 120k, and that's based on a funding rate of 70% of press release or 50% for a large company. Uh, my question is, um, are eligible project, is a project with total costs less than 85k still all right if the grant is still less than 60k? The incidents where that would happen would be an SME partnering with a university, where a university is funded at 100% of their costs. So actually, you could have a grant of 60k that would have total project costs of less than 85k. Questions, is that eligible? Yeah, um, it's a really good question. Very technical, but very, very good question. Um, yes, it is. Um, I mean, I suppose it, it did happen in one case before um, where project costs were slightly under 85. I mean, what the reason that we're, we've set those parameters are, are that's the sort of our estimate of how much we think it will cost to do the kind of work that we're expecting. So I wouldn't, for example, if you if the project costs were twenty k, we'd say, well, you know, obviously that doesn't feel like it's going to really deliver what we're looking for. That's out of scope. But if it's you know a little bit less, um, that but you're still delivering what we expect in phase one, then that would be acceptable. What I would do though in that instance would be to write in. Um, to the email on the on the application form, it says if your uh, project costs or etc are out of scope, write in, and then you just get a confirmation in writing from us that that's okay. So we'll take it on a case by case basis. Yeah, um, I'll speak to you afterwards. We did that last time. It kind of went around in circles, but um, okay. Uh, yeah, I'll have a chat with you afterwards. Yeah, have a chat with me afterwards. If you feel like it's going round and round in circles. Um, Asked to be put through straight to me, and then I can um, give a, give a clear answer in writing. Thank you. Can I ask whether the the kind of innovations you are looking for are the only product innovations? Um, because certainly I've been having some chats with folks about some market innovations as well around um, financing mechanisms. Um, and whether that's eligible or not. Yes, absolutely. Products, services, or processes. Um, certainly market intervention would be very interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's really um, anything that is going to enable uh, a, you know, change to happen. So, and in some cases, that's more process rather than product or service. Do we have any more Yeah, that is a really good question, and it's actually um, made me realise there's something else I'd need to talk about. Um, I'll have to get back to you specifically on that, um, so maybe we can exchange emails afterwards. Uh, it is a good point, particularly for small organisations, because we pay the grants in arrears, um, and so you have to have enough um, money in your bank account to fund the first three months of the activities. That will be part of the project finance checks, and we're coming across that at the moment, actually, with our first cohort. Um, so, yeah, it's something to think about. You need to have enough liquidity in your business to show that you can cover the advance, as it were, for the f whatever your first three months of project costs are. We'll need to see evidence of that in your bank account. Yeah, that's right. That's what will happen for the project costs. So, um, after each at, at each quarter, you'd submit an invoice um, for the pr previous quarter's activities, and then you'd get paid for that. <coughs> yeah, can, sorry, can I just clarify the need demand relationship and how narrowly economic is demand defined? In other words, does it have to be a service? That will be paid for rather than uh, provided as a free service based upon a local demand made in the form of a direct request for that service. 
Yeah, it's a really good point. And in many cases, um, the users will not be the same as the customers, uh, most often probably. Um, and so we're interested in the user demand. Do people actually want to use this product or service? But we are interested, and so it may be free to them. It may be free at the point of use. But we are interested in um, commercially sustainable innovations. So someone has to pay for it, whether that's the government or a hospital or a school or um, or a corporate or some customer or buyer has to be in the mix and we have to feel confident at the end of phase one I mean you don't have to know this at the beginning of phase one but at the end of the phase one we need to feel that there is um, the potential for commercial sustainability in some form or another but it doesn't have to be directly from the users buying it but it can't we're not looking to this isn't grant funding to support a project to provide a service and then it ends when the grant funding's over. We need there to be an indication that this can sustain itself. Yeah, I mean, we we understand that this will have. It depends on the on the technology and the innovation, obviously. Um, but what we want is for, um, like I said before, the the technology to have been developed to quite a mature stage, um, so that, and, and that may well need to be refined and remodelled as a result of the findings in phase one. But we're not looking for projects that need to do a huge amount of research. Um, bef before it was anywhere close to going into the market. Any last, last Right, I see, yeah. Having a business with an office and yeah. you know, all the other administrative overheads that, 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 that we would have to charge if we were selling this service to Yeah, to I see. Um, so you can also claim for overheads. You can claim for labour, uh, materials, travel and subsistence, overheads as part of the project costs. That's right, yeah. Absolutely, that, that's fine. If it's been sold in another market, that, that's fine. 
um, because the context will be completely different in these other new markets. One thing I would say, though, is that for this um, application, we're asking people to focus on one new country as opposed to a few people in the previous event said, oh, I've got two countries I'd really like to focus on. But actually, six months is not very long. Um, and for this feasibility study, we'd really like you to focus on one country and go as deep as you can into that particular market context. The same with the SDGs. People say, well, my project uh, meets four SDGs, and it may well do, but we're asking you what's your priority SDG that you're really going to focus on tackling. Thank you. Any, any last questions? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. I'd like to now introduce uh, Jonathan Abra from the KTN, who's going to uh, give you some top tips for your proposal. Well, that was a surprise. I thought I was further down the agenda. So, <laughs> <laughs> hurrah! Um, thanks for keeping me on my toes, Charlie. Uh, thank you, Joe, for referencing uh, KTN in such glowing terms. That's that's nice to hear. Um, we recognise that some of you are. Um, old hands at this and probably know more about applying for grants than we do but there are going to be people in the room who aren't familiar with this so who are KTN and what can we do for you? Um, there's a nice little diagram um, at the top if you can see it we've got Department for Business Energy and Industrial Strategy Bays. they're the people with the money the, the government department which funds UK research and innovation, comprising all those lovely research councils and Innovate UK, with whom you are intimately familiar, or maybe not, but will be. Um, and Innovate UK has the same standing as a research council, but far more at the, the D end of the R&D spectrum. So it's about nearer to market solutions. And Innovate UK uh, has a, a significant budget, 600 and some million a year, I think, um, which it spends in various different ways, lots of it through uh, competition funding, uh, and there are different flavours of competition. But a significant chunk is in the support or connect function, um, which funds uh, the Catapult Network, uh, Enterprise Europe Network, and indeed Knowledge Transfer Network, which is who I work for and what I'm going to tell you about today. What do we do? Uh, in traditional fashion, I'll start on the right and work um, backwards. Um, we do all these different functions. Uh, and gentlemen at the back, we will provide you with these slides afterwards, so don't, don't rely on your camera. We'll, we'll give you the, the high-def version. Um, so. Uh, yes, we, we help people to navigate the, uh, the technology landscape. We, uh, we support uh, uh, industry sectors. Uh, we uh, convene cross-sector groups. All that kind of behind-the-scenes stuff. But then more at this end is probably what you're interested in. And we do a lot of um, connecting of people to appropriate resources, to collaborative partners, um, and to sources of information and then funding. Although KTN doesn't have any money, we do um, support Innovate UK in how they spend theirs. So you can see there we talk about uh, awareness and dissemination, that's letting people know that there are competitions coming up. Um, advice, project scope, advice, project men uh, proposal mentoring and follow-up. So we are the boots on the ground for Innovate UK, and if you want to follow up after this, um, this briefing event, KTN are there to help you. So how do we do that? Uh, with people, with products, and with pounds. Um, snappy little three Ps. What do I mean by that? So the people dimension. KTN is 180-ish, 
200 thereabouts uh, technical specialists. Uh, we look after different industry sectors and then there are some cross-cutting specialists like Jake in our design team. Um, I am the water and wastewater specialist for KTN but we've got uh, great expertise and experience in all sorts of technical disciplines from uh, quantum physics and photonics through to um, bioscience and trains, planes and automobiles and uh, if you want to know somebody or find some information in any technical sector to support your project development mm -hmm. then we have the links uh, and I can say that with a degree of, of confidence because uh, we have a huge reach you can see there it says a hundred thousand members um, I've put in the wrong set of slides for which I apologize because we've now got over 150,000 members on our database so you can see we've got a great um, reach across sectors and deep into sectors as well um, we convene meetings like this every week we're running several meetings in different places around the country around different competitions and different themes so you know, we are touching physically no I say that wrong um, we, we are <laughs> we are encountering in a physical space 15,000 people plus per year so as you can see we, we are conveners we are catalysts of, of uh, knowledge exchange Why would government invest um, in um, technology development? I say technology with, with inverted commas around it because I'm conscious that Joe referenced the fact that it's not just about widgets and gadgets here. We're talking about processes and business models as well for this particular competition. For the most part, we do tend to concentrate on widgets and gadgets, but please remember those those quotation marks so for every pound that um, Innovate UK invests it returns about 12 pounds to the economy now that's a number that I'm familiar with but borrowed this slide from somebody and there's did Sven explain this one on Tuesday no so <laughs> after five years projects value is 50 pounds for each pound invested well that sounds great but but I'm going to leave it at that because I think a multiplier of 12 is, is good enough in itself. So skipping over that. We're perhaps beyond this stage by dint of actually being here, but um, if you haven't already, you should discover the uh, Innovate UK funding portal. All of the competitions that Innovate UK um, runs are listed there and that they're usually trailed quite a time ahead of the actual competition launch which is great because it gives you time to prepare um, you're here after the launch of this particular competition hopefully you've been aware of it for some time and have been able to do some work behind the scenes if not you've probably still got ample time to complete your project proposal and get it in but it's well worth checking in on this uh, at regular intervals and the, the, the link is on there. So, you've had a look, you've decided that this competition is for you, you're going to put in a bid, how are you going to make sure that it gets funded? Um, what you really need is a good application guide. Ta-da! We've prepared one. If you go onto the KTN website, and the link comes later, um, so you will have this after the, the event, we've got our top tips uh, for a good application. It's there as a, a PDF. We can. Have we got any hard copies? Maybe, but you don't want hard copy. Um, so, although there are 10 top tips there, I'm just going to touch on four this morning. So, is the market big enough? Remember, this is uh, government funding, it's taxpayer money that's being invested in your idea, your project. So if you think this is going to make a marginal return on the government investment, that's probably not going to be considered particularly favourably. So we're really looking at um, a uh, 
probably more than 20% uh, return on the investment. So always bear in mind that this isn't just paying for you to do your project, it is investing in your company, in your organisation for the longer term. We're looking for ideas that can uh, return to the economy of UK PLC. And while we don't expect everything to be exported, uh, export potential is a really great indicator of the novelty of your, your particular um, um, product or service. And so we need to be able to see that it's distinctive and that there is um, something that sets it apart from the competition. So market analysis, competitor analysis, very important in the application. Uh, so we want to see some evidence that you have scoured the, uh, the market, the, uh, what are the alternatives to your product or service, and can you reference those? So can you encapsulate the state of the art as it is and what sets your idea apart? So I've said exploited in the UK and globally. Obviously for this particular competition, um, oops, what we're looking at is uh, country specific. Um, but even though you might be able to demonstrate this in Malawi or Uganda, please reference how applicable it might be in other territories. Uh, that gives an indication of the, the sorts of uh, success it might achieve. Is it at the right stage of development? Um, well, again, this, this kind of um, talks across the, the GCRF competition we're, we're discussing today because um, <coughs> if you're looking to undertake a market analysis, um, you're, you're answering this question. But if you've got um, a customer in mind, if you've already uh, determined where this might be used and in what context, ahead of going and demonstrating uh, that in-country, then you stand a greater chance of success. Shows that you've done your homework and you've actually researched what it is you're going to do. You aren't just taking a punt. Um, and some of these things that I'm saying sound ridiculous, but we see it all the time in applications. Uh, you really wouldn't believe some of the things that people will commit to writing and submit in support of funding application. So please excuse me if I sound like I'm teaching you to suck eggs. Um, but it does bear saying because some of these things do get repeated time and again. And then finally, uh, of my selected um, fundamentals, um, what are the risks involved in this? If this were a nailed on certainty and you know that you could sell 10,000 units tomorrow, go to the bank because they'll gladly give you the, uh, the money on the back of your business case. Um, we are investing, that is we, the taxpayer, through Innovate UK are investing in your idea because it's risky. but we need to see evidence that you've considered the risks and that you know how you're going to mitigate those risks. So really sit down and think about what it is that might impact on your project and what you would do to reduce those risks uh, to the minimum. But please don't say as many do that there are no risks inherent in my project because if that's the case then we're not interested. Uh, you've got to be uh, realistic about it. We don't want to um, um, put public money into something that is, is super risky but equally uh, you've got to be um, telling us that you have looked at and considered 
the risks involved in what you're doing. So where do I get my copy of the, uh, the full guide with all top 10 tips? Uh, you can go to this very long um, URL or just go to the KTN website and that's the landing page and if you go to the search term and enter application guide and then click on the magnifying glass it will take you to the document as I say you'll get these slides afterwards so you don't need to remember even that <coughs> this is um, a useful slide for the download uh, <laughs> because even I struggle to read it at this distance but it's a, an overview of the investment um, and the support that's available through the Innovate UK uh, family of organisations. So it's a, a ready reckoner for uh, where you would go if you were looking to get support or to find funding for your idea. Which only leaves me to dangle my contact details there and invite any questions. Looks like it. Oh, well, great. Oh, was that a question or no, just a thumbs up? All right. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> great. I'd like to introduce uh, Ben now, who's going to talk you through human centered design. Thanks, Charlie. Um, so, I'm Ben, I'm the innovation lead for design at Innovate UK. Um, what that often means in practice is that I'm the guy that gets invited along to stand in front of a room full of very clever technical boffins and wave the flag for the people who might actually have to reach into their pockets and pay for the stuff that's being developed or use the stuff that's being developed um, and remind everyone in the room that actually most of the time those people couldn't care less about the technology inside the thing that they're buying what they're really thinking about is what that thing is actually going to do for them, how, how it's going to make their lives e easier and so on. Today, obviously, I've got a slightly easier job than usual because Joe's done a great job already of explaining how this human-centred design approach has really been baked into this particular competition from the start as the first phase of this two-phase competition. Um, and while I can talk a little bit and will about the theory of human-centred design and how that might look, uh, manifest itself in your project. We're very lucky we've got um, Richard Hall from PDM who's going to talk after me and give you some real world examples which I always think um, is much more useful than someone just talking through diagrams uh, on screen. Um, so, uh, so Joe's already mentioned the first part of this competition is really a, a, a phase of discovery. So whilst you're coming to this um, competition probably with an idea already of, of what you'd like to do and the problem you're trying to solve um, this is really an opportunity for you to take some uh, quality time to test your theories uh, and make new discoveries and just you know effectively before you potentially ask for a larger sum of money to make the thing happen just check that it's actually the right thing to be doing take this opportunity to explore possible alternatives or to refine and improve your idea. So the project, your projects at phase one have to include a human-centered research and design methodology, which we'll talk through in a moment. They can also include activities to make sure that ultimately your prototype is going to be technically feasible. And also as part of this phase one activity, we'd like you to be thinking about how you're going to run that prototyping phase um, at phase two. So what would your prototype actually look like how, what, what kinds of people do you need to involve in that and how in order to get a meaningful output from it. Um, and these are words from the, the scope. So, so why are we taking this human-centered approach? To ensure that your innovation has the highest chance of being successfully adopted, you need to understand diverse cultural expectations, attitudes and local context. And technology alone is only ever part of the solution it's vital to put people at the heart of the innovation to ensure successful adopt, uh, adaptation, adop, adoption sorry, and commercialization. 
Um, so really, technology might be the thing that makes your ideas possible. It's very important in that sense, and it can control the, or, or um, underpin the supply of new products and services. Um, but the demand for those products and services comes from people. Those are the you know it's people that choose whether or not to actually buy and use the things you're developing, and they make those decisions based on the benefits, not the technology. And those decisions are informed by culture, perceptions, concerns, and motivations. And I guess the the important takeaway is that it's very hard to get your head around those issues if you're just sat behind your desk in the UK. Um, People behave in the real world in unexpected ways. This is a hand dryer, and if we all sat down now and dis tried to think how we could make a better hand dryer, we could probably quite easily come up with a list of technical performance requirements. It needs to displace a certain amount of airflow in a certain time, it needs to reach a certain temperature, and so on. But there are lots of things that, without a bit more thought and a, a bit more observation perhaps, we might miss. So put your hands up if you've ever used a hand dryer to dry something other than your hands most people but it might not be that might actually influence the design that you come up with it could be an opportunity to actually add value and get a competitive advantage over your competitors or at the very least a way to make the product less frustrating if you've just spilt some coffee on your shirt on the way to an interview and you've dabbed it off at the sink and then you go and discover that the hand dryer is a slot that you put your hands into that's actually quite disappointing right so um, I'm not suggesting that we all spend longer hanging around in public toilets and watching what people do, um, but that general principle that actually if you kind of really get to grips with real-world human behaviour, um, even if you think you know your market well, you can always make new discoveries. And you can, you can see, I think, that if your audience, you know, this is a product that we're all very familiar with from our day-to-day -day lives, but if your audience is actually on another continent and has very different cultures and perceptions and behavior patterns to yourself, then that, uh, that understanding really becomes even more important. Um, so a, a 2012 um, study was carried out and it, it looked into the um, health benefits of an improved cooking stove uh, design. So there's a lot of issue around um, inhalation of smoke from indoor cooking stoves uh, and so on. So they went to see how these new stoves were actually improving health. What they found was that the um, potential health benefits weren't actually being realized, not because of the technical design of the product, it was perfectly good. Um, it was just that the design hadn't ac taken account of human behavior. So the people who had the stoves weren't using them in the manner intended. It's not really fair to say they weren't using them correctly because however they're using them is how they're choosing to use them. But it wasn't the way that they had been designed to use. They weren't being maintained correctly. And also fundamentally, people just preferred their traditional cooking methods. They liked the, they believed that the flavor of the food was different. And therefore, in a lot of cases, even when they had the new stove, they were still using their existing stove alongside it, which completely negated its purpose. So the outcome of that study really was not so much criticising this design of stove, but to make the point that we really need to spend time in a, investigating in real world settings to understand how individuals' behavioural responses influence a technology's effectiveness. And we think that a human-centred design approach is one of the um, best ways that you can uh, you can bring that into your project. So um, we all understand about um, projects needing to be technically feasible and commercially viable, um, but solutions also need to be desirable to the people you're creating them for, um, and that's what human-centered design can help with. When we talk about desirability in this case, it's really in the broadest sense, so it goes far beyond just whether something looks nice. Um, it involves, does this um, solution actually meet a genuine need? Is it understandable, easy to adopt and use? Does it fit with existing behavior patterns? Is it aspirational? Does it take account of societal and cultural context? And so on, all of those important questions that your engineer might not necessarily be thinking about from the outset. So a human-centered design approach involves gathering insight and making discoveries. And again, the, uh, the competition scope in this case mentions that your project must involve work in the chosen developing country. And it's less about data and secondary research in this case. You can get a lot of information from market research and large data sets, 
but this is really an opportunity for you to go out and get some first-hand experience through, through conversations, through observation, interviews, workshops, whichever works best for you to get that quality insight. Often when we've worked and supported companies to do this kind of work in the past, they've been surprised and actually come back and said, you know what, we learned more from those three conversations that, that we did than through a, a 500 question survey that we that we'd tried previously. So that qualitative um, insight is really important. You then need the, um, the correct processes and tools to be able to translate that insight into ideas. This is something that's obviously, uh, that's I think quite often underplayed. Um, we've seen in the past people Come back, come back to us and present huge, great uh, report with all of the insights and learning that they've got through their research, but can still struggle sometimes to translate all that into, well, what are you actually going to do? How is that going to inform your idea? How are you going to do something better off the back of that? And that's a professional skill and a learned capability that professional um, designers tend to be quite good at. They can also help you with um, prototyping and testing techniques to make discoveries more quickly and uh, more cost effectively. So at phase two of this project, you're obviously considering larger scale, probably more expensive prototyping. But even before you get to that stage, there's a lot that you can do just with smoke and mirrors, if you like, to give people a sense of what you're talking about and get their feedback on a particular idea. It's very difficult to have a conversation about an idea and just explain it to someone in words. They can struggle to really tell you how they're going to respond to it. As soon as you put something on a table in front of them, whether it's just an image or whether it's a little model or a mock-up, something they can interact with, you'll get a much higher quality of, of conversation and feedback from them. So what might this actually look like in terms of your phase one project? Essentially, you need to move from, the, from a point where you've got an innovative idea that would nevertheless benefit from some further um, research into, into market um, context and, and demand. And you need to move from that to a, ultimately, at the end of phase one, delivering a report which includes your um, new discoveries and learning about the market um, and a preliminary business plan based around a refined, better informed uh, innovation idea. So it might look something like this. Um, apologies, these are generic slides and embryonic is probably not quite the case. I think in this case, your idea is probably slightly beyond embryonic, um, but nevertheless benefit would benefit from some further um, refinement. So you start with your idea and the first thing you're gonna do is go through this um, divergent phase of discovery, of gathering as much contextual understanding around the problem that you're trying to solve and potential solutions as possible. Then taking that broad research and starting to synthesize it down to filter out the red herrings from the real nuggets, the little gems of information that could actually help uh, steer the direction of your innovation. And ultimately what you're aiming for here is what I've called a kind of recipe for success. So all of the things that your idea is going to need to deliver in order to be successful, all the things you need to take account of. And the purpose of going through this initial discovery phase is really to make that list a bit longer. So again, thinking back to the, the cooking stove example, not just it needs to uh, reach a certain temperature, it needs to, uh, you know, all the functional stuff, but also we need to think about what the food tastes like when it's done. We need to think about whether it's easy to maintain and what does easy maintenance mean in this particular instance. We need to think about the kind of environment in which the stove is going to be installed and how that might inform its uh, design. So a much longer list um, of contextual inputs. So then having got that recipe for success, that's if you like your inspiration or your starting point for another divergent phase of, okay, how are we gonna to respond to these, uh, to these insights? And this is where you can start exploring alternative ideas. Might be a completely different way of solving the problem or it might just be refinements to the ex idea that you've already got. Um, it's shown here as a kind of linear process, but the reality is that as you're going through this, you're using those quick visualization and uh, prototyping mock-up tools to get valid feedback from people. So test your ideas with people on an ongoing basis um, and go through quick iterative cycles to figure out what's working and what isn't. 
ultimately as you go through that process you're then trying to refine those ideas down towards a single concept if you like that you can take forward for prototyping at phase two so a more refined better better informed idea um, a business case built around that and a plan for how you're going to prototype it at phase two and you can really think of that almost as a, as a sort of two-phase activity so the first half there is really about understanding the problem space uh -huh. Um, what is the problem that you're trying to solve? How can we make sure that we're actually uh, doing the right thing? And then what's the best solution to that problem? And figure out how best to do the thing uh, to the best of your abilities. Um, the process that we've just talked through is actually um, based on uh, something called the Double Diamond Framework, which the Design Council in the UK um, talk about. Um, there are many variations on that theme. If you look up human-centered design processes online, you'll find all sorts of toolkits and methodologies out there. They tend to be fairly similar. Some have three phases, some have five phases. Um, because they're created by designers, they usually got lovely color codes and icons and so on, look very pretty. The truth is that it tends to be the same kind of thing on the left here. You can still see a phase of divergent exploration converging on a particular uh, brief or problem. Uh, and then exploring different solutions to that. It's all the same kind of thing, and we're quite open to whichever methodology you choose to follow, as long as it is genuinely human-centered design approach. Ultimately, what we're trying to avoid, and what we see all too often in technology-led development, is this kind of approach. where And it's just kind of human nature. We all tend to do this, particularly if we've got an idea which we really strongly believe in. Um, it tends to be based on our assumptions, what we think we know, what we've experienced ourselves or from previous experiences. So we skip through a lot of that front-end research because we don't have the time and the money to do it. Hooray, this, actually, this competition is giving you the space to do that. Um, we tend to be quite precious about the ideas that we've got, so we don't really think as divergently as we could at that um, development phase. Uh, we don't really look at, well, perhaps there's a different way that we could do this. Um, and really, the bulk of the time is actually spent developing the single idea that you've got towards a reality, um, which might work, but it's quite a risky approach because it, it does mean that at the end of the day, you could find that you've got a solution that just isn't, isn't right for the people um, that you're developing for. So that's what we'd like to see in terms of how you might actually access um, design within your project. For some of you, this might be um, quite a familiar process and something that you're planning to do anyway or have the capability to do. For many others, I think it will be a case of bringing in professional design talent to support um, this first phase of the, of the project. Up to 50% of your eligible project costs at, the, at phase one can be used for subcontracting. So if you do, for example, want to work with a design agency or a design consultant, um, they don't necessarily have to come in as a contributing project partner. You can, really, you can just engage them as subcontractors, which makes the whole um, process a bit simpler. Um, it, it does present you with a good opportunity to work with, um, with, with designers, and we think that's worth doing. Um, but also, we'd encourage you to get involved with the design process too, so that this becomes not just um, an opportunity for a better project outcome, but also for you as a business to understand a bit more about how design works and perhaps integrate some of those processes going forward or to develop a lasting relationship with a design partner. We've talked already today about the KTN being a very useful resource in terms of contacts, and they certainly have a network of designers that they can connect you into if you, if you need that kind of support. Um, the Design Council in the UK is not a membership um, association, so they don't have a, um, a directory of members, but they, what they do have is a lot of case studies um, and information about design. So if you have, want to get a better understanding of how a business like yours could integrate design, it's a good, um, a good place to go. The British Industrial Design Association, the Design Business Association and the Service Design Network do have member directories, so if you're looking for people um, experiencing with a particular uh, design discipline, whether it's product design, service design, front-end design research, those are good places to, uh, to look. And if you, um, if you want to kind of look yourself, just go, go online, then uh, the key really is to look for people with human-centered um, research and design experience, uh, expertise. So some might be more uh, skilled in, the, in design for manufacture and the later stage design, if you like. Others might have more experience 
um, perhaps relevant for this competition related to um, uh, front-end uh, user-centred um, research. And particularly in this case, I think if you're looking to develop for a, a certain market, trying to find someone with um, experience of, uh, of carrying out design studies in that, in that market would be a, a useful thing to do. Okay, that's all from me. Thank you. <laughs> uh, right, we will. someone else you 
you be part of this and you'll seek the guidance that you need or seek the input or professional services from as you <coughs> see fit? Can I make one? I'm just going to um, make one point which actually relates to something that, that came up at the previous brief, briefing event. And it's probably worth mentioning here as well that although we're structuring this as two phases and phase <coughs> one is the human centered design study. That's not to say necessarily that you can't continue that relationship with the same people into phase two. And in fact, I think that's in a lot of cases the right way to approach it. Don't necessarily see this as well at the end of this six month period, that's the design bit finished and wave goodbye to your design partner. If you've developed a good relationship, you actually want to have, you know, might actually be good to have them involved with that prototype and phase as well. Then uh, this is a loaded question because I already know this competition quite quite well. But <laughs> what you're talking about sounds like just talking to people, and whether it's designers or anthropologists, why can't I just go talk to them myself? Uh, could you tell us a little bit about why an excellent design partner is necessary for the confidence to go into phase two of this competition? Yeah, I guess. I mean, to. Uh, um, I'm conscious that we've got Richard coming up next. <laughs> and I suspect that actually a designer telling you how this works on the ground might give you a better answer than, than I can give. I think a lot of it is to do with that translation of the insight and also having the experience to know exactly how to structure those com conversations and what kinds of questions to ask. If you just go out and ask people what they want, you know, I, I learned quite recently that the, the, uh, this is actually this actually wasn't said, but there's a kind of, I think it was a Henry Ford thing, of if we, if we asked people what they wanted, they'd have said faster horses. Right, no one would have envisaged the car. Apparently he never said that, which is a bit disappointing. Um, <laughs> but, but that's true, you know, if you just ask people what they want, or if you kind of show people something and say, I don't think this is a great idea. Um, when people talk about what, how they behave, it's often not the same as how they really behave, right? So there's a, there is a professional, uh, capability and skill involved with how you go about that research. Again, to the point that was made earlier, designers aren't the only people that can do that. Designers tend to be quite good at um, quick, fast interventions, but you, if you want a bit more in-depth, uh, rigorous approach, then perhaps um, the, the research science community have, have something to offer there. So I think how you go about the research is important, and then also the point that was made about being able to then translate that insight into okay, what does this actually look like as a physical detail on a product or a particular um, service structure? Any more questions? No? Um, we have a report. We have a report um, which has lots of really, really useful um, case studies here um, about human-centered design um, right from the start all the way through to um, deploying your technology. So these have arrived just in the nick of time. Um, you'll be able to pick up a, a copy out um, on the desk there, so please, please do grab one uh, before you go. Um, I'd now like to introduce Richard Hall, who's uh, going to tell you about human-centered design in action. Yeah, yeah. great. Um, so I'm really glad to be here um, to talk about human-centred design. Uh, my name is Richard Hall and I am a designer. Um, that's my uh, uh, confession for today. Uh, I've been asked to talk about human-centred design and also, in particular, a live project that we're working on, uh, which is to do with global health. Um, so there's some crossover with, with what Ben's already spoken about today, so I'm not going to apologise for saying the same things that's already been spoken about. Uh, but as you've heard today, um, design can be misunderstood and, and mis misinterpreted. Um, many people think it's part of a process that comes towards the end of a project, perhaps. Um, and the risk, if, the risk is if design isn't adopted, uh, that it will fail. Um, you'll have a product which isn't fit for purpose. You'll, ha you'll create a product where there isn't actually a need for it. Um, so creating, a, creating a, a solution to a problem that doesn't exist is, is uh, something that you really need to avoid. And we'd call this uh, lipstick, on a bit, on, lipstick on a pig in design terms. 
I think something that's been mentioned today as well is talking about technology. So I work with um, lots of different organisations, universities, um, startups, SMEs and PLCs, and your, your user really is not interested in the technology. Now I appreciate that some of the technology that you adopt is really interesting and sexy and, and front-end and, and advanced, but if you focus on the user, they, they, there is ex an expectation that the technology is there. What they're interested in is how does it relate to them. So the questions that you need to ask yourself is, um, does it make your uh, client or your user's uh, life easier? Does it make the process quicker? Uh, does it address an actual need? Where's the intrinsic value? And where's the, where is the value proposition? So these are the things you need to start to initially kind of think about with your particular technology or your process. Um, so this is a Sinclair C5. Can I ask people to raise their hands who know what this actually is? <laughs> right. Can I also ask um, the audience to shout out what their perception is of this product? Okay, rubbish. <laughs> so everybody said rubbish, great. Okay, um, so those that are uh, millennials, uh, this, is, this is a Sinclair C5. So this is something which was created by Sir Clive Sinclair, who had previously made his money in computing and calculators. Um, so he tried his hand at, uh, at um, portable transport for, for one person. So this was going to revolutionise uh, how we transport ourselves uh, around and about town. Um, so arguably, it's technically brilliant. It's got a battery in there, so it's a, it's a, a velo cycle, so you, you pedal, but also there's a battery that can give you assistance in terms of range. Uh, this thing runs at about 26 miles an hour, so it's quite nippy. Um, the the uh, aerodynamics were, de were designed by Lotus, a guy that me and, and, and Ben kind of know between us. So technically brilliant, advanced. Uh, the problem with it is it just didn't really consider the user. Um, this product went right from start, right through to the end. 15,000 products were manufactured. I think 5,000 were sold in the end, but it was a huge uh, catastrophic failure. Um, and the reason for that is that there was no inclination, no uh, insight in terms of the user. Because this thing was riding on, on the ground at a very low level, you know, the obvious perception here is that people didn't, didn't want to be uh, literally a foot off the ground with articulated lorries flying past them. It was just too dangerous. So whilst there was a perception of a user need, the actual way that it was supplied was misre misrepresented. So this is probably a good example of a failure of human-centred design. And ironically, uh, in our studio, um, so I run a design agency, we have a C5, uh, and it serves as a constant reminder when people come through the door and we have meetings, and we're always trying to pull people back in terms of the value of user-centred design in context. Um, so for all the wrong reasons, it's now a design classic. So when people come in the studio, they're really excited that we've actually got a C5, and some people ask us, is that the latest project you, that you're working on? But actually, it's not. Um, so human-centered design. Um, this is probably uh, a snapshot. If you're not part of the problem, you can't be part of the solution. So um, human-centered design is a very strategic process. Um, some people know it as user-centered design. Some people know it as co-design, which is more of a buzzword now. Um, in medical terms, it's called PPI, which is patient and public participation. So if, you've, if you're involved with uh, funding, for example, from the NAHR, so um, i for i Product Development Awards or i for i Connect, one of the fundamental questions that you'll be asked by NAHR is, how have you addressed PPI? Um, so it's becoming more as a mandate, for, particularly for funding, in terms of demonstrating to your funders that you've, you've taken consideration of early stage insight. Part of this as well is to look at, um, so human centered design, as Ben mentioned, isn't about talking to people. It's about um, assembling a key opinion, a KOLs, key opinion leaders. It's about assembling a, an independent team, which might be, in the case of a medical device, it might be a surgeon, might be a patient. 
Um, and having a focus group and a strategic process where you constantly iterate and have touch points to make sure that what you are designing and creating and resolving is actually fit for purpose. Um, it's also important to note uh, in terms of user-centred design to try and kill an idea fast and kill it cheap, which I'll talk about in a second. So here are the key challenges that, the key challenges that you need to consider in terms of human-centred design. So you have the technology in the lab or the studio, but will it work in the field? Will your global st stakeholders engage? How do you access and validate product and user viability, actual and data-driven? Does the technology easily translate from academia, research to the end user, environment, language, best practice, etc.? And what localised considerations might you, might you have missed, which is something that's been spoken about already today? So I've got, I'm sorry, but I've got another graph here. So this is called the Gartner Hype Cycle. Um, this kind of plots innovation uh, from start to finish, and some of you may be familiar with this. Um, so you noticed that I mentioned earlier about uh, looking at failing ideas and products early and fast and cheap, um, which is a perfectly viable uh, methodology to go through. So the Gartner Hype Cycle it kind of plots an innovation pathway so it starts with the trigger. So there's always got to be a viable trigger for a project to start. And what you need to do is, is validate that trigger point, whether it's, it's more efficient or it's a disruptive technology or there's a user need, for example. And then we have the peak of inflated expectations where everybody thinks that the idea that you're working on is the best thing since sliced bread and it's going to make an awful lot of money, et cetera, et cetera. But then as a project migrates forward, you come into all sorts of uh, problems and issues and challenges where you uh, fall into the trough of disillusionment. And then hopefully, if you've got enough budget and you've got the right team around it and you, you've got a strategy in place and you've got uh, the right kind of uh, resource, that you will start to migrate into the slope of enlightenment and then the plateau of productivity. The key point here is the valley of death. Uh, which a lot of people are familiar with, where you've really pushed a technology or a process and you just can't take it any further and the project uh, fantastically fails. Um, what I'm trying to show here in terms of the value of death is um, human-centred design can be a composite of why a project will actually fail. Um, so why you need to engage with human-centred design is to help uh, mitigate that risk or avoid the risk in the first place. So this is the reason why you need to get a uh, professional designer uh, on board from the start of a project. So I'm just going to talk briefly about um, what we do. Um, so it's not just me, I am a designer, but I've got a team of designers. Um, we're not just about human-centered design, we get involved in all, all aspects of design from research, insight, observational, 3D printing, virtual reality, uh, design for manufacture, augmented reality, design strategy, innovation, etc., etc. So these are kind of some of the aspects that we get involved with. So in terms of the actual live project, so this is something that has been supported through GCRF, through the University of Leeds, who is who is part of the uh, part of our partners, and the project which we are working on um, address, addresses the goals of these three key themes. So I'm now going to talk about the actual project itself to give you some kind of context. It is a medical device. We don't just work on medical devices, but it's just, just this so, so happens to be a medical device. So um, this is uh, an abdomen. Um, so in, in the developed world, you'll have something called uh, laparoscopy, uh, which is effectively known as keyhole surgery. So if you have a patient which is um, poorly and they've got uh, problems in the abdomen, Rather than go open surgery, uh, lap surgery has been developed since the 1960s, which, which is a very efficient and effective uh, process uh, whereby you have two or three ports that go into the abdomen and then the surgeon uses keyhole surgery using uh, instruments to carry out the procedure. Um, in order to do lap surgery, you, you need to insulate the abdomen, so you need to blow gas into the abdomen so you have this nice kind of window of, of, of envelope of area so the surgeon can actually move and articulate organs and tissue out of the way. So this is typically how it would be used. Um, 
very specialised process. Uh, the, the, this, the project that we're working on is not just about the product, it's actually also about um, surgeons in the UK um, training uh, uh, rural surgeons in India best practice for lap surgery as well. So that's kind of how it works. The problem is that in, in uh, LMICs, low to middle income countries, the availability of gas to insufflate the abdomen isn't, is not around, it's too expensive. And in remote areas of India, there just isn't access to um, uh, CO2 to insufflate the abdomen in the first place. Um, so a technique has been developed by a, a guy called Dr. Gunaraj in India. It was originally pioneered in Japan uh, many years ago, but it's been adopted by LMIC. So Dr. Gunaraj is kind of um, taking it to the next stage of actually how do we um, carry out lap surgery without using gas. Um, and the way that they do that is uh, called tenting. So on the left you have an insufflated abdomen with gas. Uh, because gas isn't available, it sounds really crude, but the way that it's performed in LMIC is there is effectively a corkscrew that goes into the umbilicus. Uh, it's pulled up and uh, it causes tenting. So it effectively gives you a window, an envelope of room so that the surgeon can carry out what is effectively lap surgery but without the costly resource of, of, of gas. It's also done with a spinal block um, so the patient is um, effectively paralysed from the shoulders down so they don't feel anything. Um, so this is the project that we are kind of effectively um, uh, involved with. Um, there are products out there that carry out gasless surgery but the, they're not very efficient, they're not, not portable, they're expensive etc etc. So the thing that really kind of resonates with us as a business is um, for somebody that, that, that works in rural India, a mother or a father, um, because there's no access to uh, traditional uh, uh, lap surgery, the uh, kind of default position is, is open surgery um, in the abdomen. The problem with that is that the recovery rate is much longer, the, the uh, procedure is more complicated, it carries higher risk and the recovery rate is, is prolonged. And the actual reality of this in humanitarian terms is that, you know, if a family working in rural India can't work, then they can't feed the family. It's kind of as raw as that. So this is where this, this, is where this product comes into place, and we're kind of in the early stages of it. So here's the project team. It spans the UK and India. So uh, in the UK, um, it's led by University of Leeds, so um, engineers at University of Leeds. Uh, we also have a surgeon from the NHR. So the NHR is the National Institute of Health Research, which is the research arm of the NHS. So uh, Noel's part of the team. And then over in India, uh, we've got, uh, we're working with uh, a teaching hospital in Delhi. So we've got uh, Anurag and Lovinish, uh, who are qualified surgeons, but they're also academics. So they are working with us to help translate and work through this product. Dr. Gunaraj is the guy on the ground in terms of carrying out these procedures. And then we also have rural surgeons. So these are the guys that are working in remote parts of India. Um, so this is effectively the cohort. So we have a translation from you know, a design perspective, an engineering perspective, a clinical perspective, but also deployment. And what we have in this project is reach right from the start to the finish. Um, so we're not making design assumptions or decisions that are unfounded. And this is, how, this is the value of human-centered design. And then there's us. Um, so we're a small design agency uh, based in Thursk. Um, we get involved in all aspects of design, but this is kind of our involvement in it. So you don't need to work with a large design consultancy. Um, the point is you need to work with a design professional that's got, that's got the skills mm -hmm. and ability to work through user-centered design and, 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 um, and kind of collaborate with the team. So this is the initial stages of the project. Um, so this is in Kolkata uh, last year and it's all about insight. It's all about getting to the coalface. So um, this is part of the team, so we've got uh, on the right Dr. Gunaraj and Noel to the left uh, and then there's some people from, there's me and there's some of the team from PDM there. Um, so it's all about literally rolling your sleeves up, scrubbing up and going into theatre, in this case the coalface. 
So this is looking at the existing um, uh, medical device which has got significant deficiencies. So that's me in theatre seeing what's actually going on and the point of this is that I need to see the context of the problem. I don't want to be contaminated with a surgeon or a clinician who thinks, who tells me what they think the design solution may or may not be. So to actually go into theatre or whatever your project is, to go get on the ground and talk to people, as Ben mentioned earlier, having two or three conversations has got more efficacy than a 500 page report. Um, and in that you kind of, you do learn nuggets of information so you can make assumptions but when you get on the ground and actually see a procedure you learn so much more. So in the case of this it's understanding how they fit the medical device to the bed, the complications with that, what's sterile, what's not sterile, how it needs two people to, uh, to use this uh, medical device, how it's sterilised, um, portability etc etc. So from that, you know, if you get to the cold face, you can really get some good insight. Uh, and working with a surgeon with the human-centred clinical perspective, you, you gain so much more information. And you effectively kind of become, kind of become a surgeon where you, where you can think with authority. So just to put it into context, this is the actual device that, we'll, that, that is currently out there. It is, as I mentioned before, it is really expensive, it's difficult to clean, it's not portable. So this is so so the concept of gasless surgery uh, by putting a corkscrew in the umbilicus and and creating tent, tenting has got restrictions primarily because of the device and how it's kind of being created. So this is in Colcott Hospital. These are the four rural surgeons that we're working with that are out in the field. Um, so this is us having formal discussions with their team about the reality of actually using this device or product in the market. And we're going into the real detail now in terms of understanding what the problem statement is. Um, and that way you can get some rapport. It's not a case of, yes, we're capturing data, but a lot of it is to understand the context of, 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 of um, what their perceptions are. So some things you can't actually put in a Q&A. You've got to really kind of talk to them. And the more time you can spend at the front end of a project, then the better. What came from this is that human-centred design is absolutely critical for this project to be a success. So this is uh, Pippa talking to one of, the, um, uh, one of the rural surgeons in the real detail. So that's the corkscrew that goes into the umbilicus, talking about the complications looking at the, the uh, BMI of different patients, talking about how, how we might be able to create a device that's used for paediatric as well as um, up to BMI of 25. So it's kind of this, um, I'm not going to talk about divergent thinking, but this is kind of, as Ben mentioned earlier, where you need to, you need to open your mind and look at all of the options that are out there before you start to get um, streamlined or kind of uh, blinkered into going down one particular direction. And this is just a graph to demonstrate what we disseminated in terms of the information. Um, too heavy, um, sterilization was a big problem. It wouldn't fit into an autoclave because of the physical size of it. There was a ball joint on it, which was a great idea. However, because of the, the thermal range in you know, working in different, different areas of rural India, the thermal properties had an, had an effect on the functionality of that and it, and it slipped. Um, how it fits onto a bed, so we had to consider what beds are out there in LMIC and how we actually secure this to the device. So work packages and research into what, the, what beds are out there, what condition they're in. So it kind of creates the, um, you know, kind of a, a landscape of understanding of what the actual project is. And then something which is also really important is creation of the, creation of the problem st statement. So it's something, that's been, something that's been touched on today what is the problem that you're actually trying to solve? And it's worth kind of reviewing where you are with your project and really getting some insight to, to validate that what you consider the problem is actually the problem. And then, in very basic terms, this outlines a, a, a design brief which captures the, the needs of the user. And it's really, this is a really important document because you need to constantly reference back to this because in design and development terms, 
if you're not careful, uh, it, it can migrate kind of off, off course. So this is a really good document to constantly iterate and come back and review where you are with it. So I'm sorry, I've got another graph here. Um, so this is the perceived design process. You have an idea, uh, you create a CAD model, you make a prototype, you test it, and then you kind of launch it. Uh, but the reality of actually the design world is more something like this. Um, and the fog of uncertainty is a perfectly valid uh, process to, to, to embrace. Uh, I think there's always a, a, um, a, um, a need to kind of go from A to B as quickly as you can. As Ben mentioned earlier with a double diamond, this, the second part of the diamond is, is heavily skewed because the first part of the double diamond, there hasn't been enough divergent thinking in the first place. So had, to have a fog of uncertainty is absolutely fine. As long as you know you, that you're going the right general direction of travel forwards, that's fine. So these are the kind of things that you know, we would work through in terms of research, understand, interrogate, and then convergence, ideate, iterate, and focus and implement, implementation. Um, in terms of human-centered design, this is, this is how human-centered design is involved. So right from the very start at the coal phase, so pre-research phase, so observational. And this is where you can try and kill an idea early and fast and cheap. Uh, if you've got human-centered design at the very front, um, you, can, you can either kill an idea or you can establish where the points of weakness are rather than leaving it laterally in, in points of the projects where you're trying to rescue something because you realise that actually um, there isn't really a demand for your particular innovation. And it runs all the way through. So our human centred design on this particular project, there are touch points all the way through this particular project to make sure that we are validating it with the user. And even after launch, you know, post-market surveillance and human centred design is really important. You've got to go back and establish what you thought and what collectively everybody thought was going to work, actually does work, and then look at next stages of. So in terms of divergent thinking, so, you know, we looked at the context of the problem, we understood what the surgeons needed, we understand, understood what the limitations were. So this project isn't about advanced manufacturing by any stretch of the imagination. Part of this project is that this product will be manufactured in India. So we've got to make considerations for the resource and capability of an Indian manufacturer. Um, so this is us kind of, you know, divergent thinking, lots of ideas of how we can do it. Thinking perhaps about 3D printing, adopting 3D printing, um, looking at off-the-shelf things. So, for example, um, uh, telescopic arrangements. So an, an off-the-shelf um, um, material that's, that's readily available, how can we use that to, to uh, develop, a pro develop the idea forward? looking how we would lock it off. So from the inside in theatre, we know that there needs to be five degrees of movement on this thing. So that the surgeon, whether, they're doing, whether they are doing um, um, lower bowel or, or, or gallbladder, they need to have that range of movement so that the, so that the uh, coil can go into the right aspect of the, of the abdomen. Then design, develop, make, test and repeat. So this is something which is I do think that people underestimate, they get a solution and tend to go with that and move it forward. Um, it's always important to look at, to really explore all the avenues to make sure that you have got a design which is fit for purpose. You need to be able, at the end of a design solution where somebody can ask you why did you do this or do that or what's that feature here, if you can't reasonably justify why it looks like it does or how it functions like it does, uh, then you're kind of on dangerous ground. So what we find is, you know, yes, we are designers, but we are more facilitators. Um, so looking at different ideas and techniques. 3D printing is brilliant because it allows us to rapidly uh, compress the design time. It allows us to try things out without too much consideration. It allows us to um, move down, move down different avenues that we thought might not work, but actually sometimes do work. So I'm sure lots of people got access to a 3D printer if you're product is of sufficient size to warrant it. But this is a really great technology and we, we've got loads of 3D printers at our place that we use all of the time. 
And then because we've got the insight um, from the clinical perspective, this is all about engineering development, so early stage validation. Because we've got that kind of um, human-centered knowledge, we don't have to go back to the surgeon every five days to ask them what they think about it. If, you, if, you, if you've been in the cold face, you understand the context of the problem, you can confidently articulate potential design solutions and at relevant milestones go back to your stakeholder, surgeon, patient um, to explain your design theorem behind it and, and, um, and work through the development pathway. And then this is as our place, um, a general design review with the uh, guys at University of Leeds having a, um, you know, comparing the, on the left there, the existing kind of product with the product on the right, looking at the technical aspects of this thing, looking at how we can get that degree of freedom of movement, how we're going to sterilise it, how quickly it is to assemble and deploy. Uh, getting into the real kind of nitty-gritty detail collectively as a team, as a design and engineering team. And then when, when we are happy with what we have worked up, then going back to the clinical lead. So this is Noel, he's the surgeon who works for the NAHR, who's kind of core to this project. And this is where the surgeons or your user get, get their hands on, on prototypes and really try things out. I think Ben mentioned earlier that it's all very good talking about the theorem of things. But actually, if you can um, show people products, even an, an early stage prototype, people can relate to that a lot more. I mean, we use VR a lot, a lot now for very, very early stage design thinking because it, it, it makes it very um, uh, translatable. You know, if somebody gives you a 3D print, you, you can instantly form a view on that and you can articulate your thoughts. And from that, you can get some traction in terms of how you would develop the project, for the project or product further. And then from what we'd learned there, uh, Dr. Gunraj, the guy who has been pioneering it in rural India, he came to the UK and at St. James's Hospital in Leeds, uh, we had a box trainer and the box trainer kind of replicates an abdomen. And um, you see Dr. Gunraj got, got straight in there and trying things out. So he's got the knowledge and now we are presenting something to him which he hasn't really seen before. Uh, and he's really getting into the detail of how it actually works and looking at articulating things. Um, and that is another, you know, another clear touch point that we have to get, that we have to work through. Then after Dr. Dr. Gunaraj came to uh, Leeds, we then went back out to a place called Bangalore, uh, which is uh, about five hours from Bangalore. And part of this team, um, we had um, three or four days in, um, in Bangalore, which was catavote trials. So through all the ethics, um, the guys in Delhi, uh, we had ethical approval to have, I think, four cadavers for a four-day study. And this is where we really do take our hands off the steering wheel. And uh, so for this project, we had uh, fully working prototypes that were production intent. Uh, then we had the rural surgeons that, that flew in, and we had the, a, a typical bed set up. And we had the cadavers that were um, that were in the right BMI threshold, and then we spent four days um, with the rural surgeons trying these things out. Um, so going back to the touch point of, of usability, really testing the testing the water with, with the surgeons. Um, I think it's really important to take your hands off. I mean, I talk about taking your hands off steering wheel, but it's really important as early as you can because there's always a tendency to kind of cling on to your innovation. Um, but the earlier that you can take your hands off the steering wheel and get the right team around you, then the project has got a better chance of success. I think the other aspect of this is that you've got to be receptive to change as well. So more cadaveric, that's um, one of the uh, associate professors and, uh, and uh, Pippa from our place, uh, trying out the real detail. That's Anurag and Gunrish on the right from uh, Delhi, trying things out as well. And then obviously we needed to have clinical feedback. So after that, back into collecting data, was, it, was the experience as they anticipated? Did we manage to address all of the issues that we'd discussed in India previously? Uh, how could we improve it? Um, looking at materials, uh, looking at portability, sterilization, et cetera, et cetera. 
So that's kind of where we are at the moment. We've got a pretty, pretty well formed uh, design solution. I've not shown you any images of the design solution because we're just going through IP at the moment. So kind of where we're on the project right now is um, uh, design for manufacture and regulatory. Because this is an LCIM product, it's going to be manufactured in India. So I was recently in Delhi and um, Mumbai. So we're talking to uh, three potential manufacturers. So part of our, our uh, um, involvement in the project is to translate um, what we would call the design intent, what the design solution is, through to something which is manufacturable. So we're looking at optimizing the cost. We're looking at um, ensuring that the manufacturer doesn't make any significant changes that inadvertently affect the value of the, of the product. Um, and that's the next stage that we're going through. Um, we're also looking at regulatory. So uh, in the UK, we work on MDR, medical device regulations. In India, it's slightly different in terms of whether a CE mark is needed or not. Um, so that's where we are at the moment. And once we have launched this product in India, we're looking at, we're working with a company called MedAid in Africa of translating that technology into Africa. So we appreciate that there might be some nuances, but that's the intention for 2022 is to look at the African market. So this is my penultimate slide. Um, so I've gone through quite a lot, I've been talking about human-centered design and the need to get to the core face early. But these are my kind of takeouts from understanding a bit more about human-centered design and how it can add value to your project or product or process. So the first thing is don't underestimate the value. So right at the top of the talk, you know, C5, everybody's familiar with it. So probably perhaps don't think too far away from a C5 in terms of how things can go badly wrong where, when assumptions are made and when people assume that the technology will, will make people buy a product or a service. Um, try and kill the idea fast and cheap. It is completely counterintuitive to thinking, but if you can kill an idea quick and cheap, then you might look for... The first thing is you know, you're avoiding wasting resource and time laterally. But also, um, you might look for points of weakness that you've never, never um, estimated before. Find an experienced design professional. So I'm kind of hoping that there are other, other designers in this room that you need to talk to. Um, assemble a good team. So I've been, uh, so PDM is a business that has been around since 2005. One thing I do know is that if you have a good team, uh, a good cohort and a good team around a project, you've got a much better chance of success. It isn't about the technology, it's all about people working together, have, having complementary skills. And I think part of this, we mentioned earlier, is to, is to get on board the right, the right team that can help um, and challenge, you know, challenge each other. Um, understand that good design is strategic and not aesthetic, so just think about lipstick on a pig again. Um, get to the core face early. So it's a long way to go to India and to scrub up and go to theatre, but that's the only way that you can do these things. So if you have a product or process, you need to get to your coal face early and ask those difficult questions. Not talking about questionnaires, I'm talking about having open and direct conversations with people, observing what, uh, what the current status quo is, uh, gaining insight, because that can really kind of um, have an effect on how your project migrates. Challenge and be challenged. So we do work with universities and um, there is a strategic way to challenge an academic um, in terms of, um, you know, um, trying to make them understand that there are other ways to kind of innovate. Um, trying to be, um, uh, so that's, that's another thing. You need to be, um, if you're an academic and you've got an idea and you, and you just go um, hell for leather and that's your solution, then it's, it is probably going to fall into the valley of death, to be perfectly honest. So you've got to be, you've got to be the kind of mindset where you are, where you are uh, receptive to change and, and taking your hands off the steering wheel. Uh, adopt human-centered design from the outset and all the way through. So this isn't something you bolt on at the end. This is something that you get get your hands dirty and get to the coal face right at the very start. Um, establish the, the uh, establish and characterize your target user. So find out the people that would use your product or service. Go and talk to them. 
Um, assemble key opinion leaders, stakeholders, and engage at, at key, key milestones. So you can see on our project, we had and do have touch points all the way through. And it allows us to go back to the problem statement and the design brief to make sure that we are on target with this as, as a design solution. And then the other one is it starts and ends with collaboration. Thanks. Um, any questions? <laughs>